can you write down the second law of thermodynamics for a closed system? What does the equation look like for a closed system? The final entropy at the end of the process, we'll do it for a process, right? Minus the initial entropy of the system. How can it increase? How can it increase? Heat transfer. Sometimes you put Q1 to 2 divided by TB. So how much heat was transferred in, that's our sign convention, divide that by the absolute boundary temperature at which it crossed into the closed system, the boundary temperature, and then you have that entropy brought in with that heat transfer. Mine, uh, th what else do you have? Do you have any minus? You have plus a sigma 1 to 2. Uh, where is work in this equation? That's organized energy transfer has no entropy transfer with it. Heat is disorganized energy transfer. Work is organized energy transfer. Okay, so that helps, hopefully helps you. Uh, then we're going to get to entropy balance for an open system. And then it's just problems, problems, problems. You have to solve a lot of problems. Conservation of energy. There was a conservation of energy principle. True? What did it say? Energy is conserved in some processes. All, all physical, actual processes. Is that what it says? Is that the conservation of energy principle? Or can there be some actual processes where energy is not conserved? You just need to do your bookkeeping better. Somewhere that energy went to, you need to keep track of it. Sometimes we bookkeep only on mechanical energy. And then if it goes out of the equation, well, it went through viscous dissipation to internal energy, but it went somewhere in the form of energy. Energy is truly conserved. The only processes that occur are those for which energy of an isolated system is conserved. You can take a look and find this back in the textbook dealing with energy. So that if you have an isolated system consisting of the system and its nearby surroundings, that making the universe, and now that's the isolated system, either the energy of the system goes up or down, and the energy of the surroundings go up or down, but the sum is always zero for a process. Okay? Let's talk about the increase in entropy principle. Not the conservation of entropy principle, but the increase of entropy principle, saying that entropy is produced in all actual processes, and only processes that occur are those for which the entropy of the isolated system increases. So, again, uh, you have your system, you have its nearby surroundings, you define this as your isolated system, and you say that either the entropy of the system goes up or down, the entropy of the surroundings can go up or down, but when you sum them together, they have to be greater than zero because there is some production. Now, you can say it's greater than or equal to zero if you have frictionless, no irreversibilities, but there's always some friction. There's always some irreversibilities. It's just the engineer's goal is to minimize it, typically. True? You want to minimize it. That will uh, improve the performance of the system. Okay? So that's the increase in entropy principle. We can solve a problem. Do we want to st start by solving a problem? Air is contained in a rigid, insulated tank with a paddle wheel. So you just draw a tank, make it insulated, put a paddle wheel in. What's the paddle wheel do? Energy transfer by work, but no entropy with that work transfer. That's what a paddle wheel. You'll see a paddle wheel all the time. You say, why? Why all of a sudden the, the great excitement in thermodynamics about paddle wheels? Right? I took statics. I took dynamics. No paddle wheels. But all of a sudden thermo, every other problem has paddle wheel in it. Right? Well, maybe not every other problem, but you get the point. The air is initially at a given temperature and pressure, so P1 of 4 bar, uh, T1 of 21 degrees C, you might as well convert that to 294 Kelvin, and the volume is constant. Uh, the volume of the tank is rigid, so 
it's V is equal to 0 0.3 meters cubed. It's air. When you see air, what do you think? Ideal gas. It is stirred until the temperature becomes 168 degrees C, which is 441 Kelvin. Assume air behaves as ideal gas. Use constant specific heats. Here's the value of C sub P, the value of C sub B, and the value of K, which is the ratio. Determine the final pressure in bar. How do you find the final pressure in bar, P2? Then find the work, 1 to 2. Then the amount of entropy produced in the system. Well, you would just use the ideal gas relation that PV over T is equal to R. Well, okay, put NR bar there or put MR there, one or the other. But this is true at state 1. It's also true at state 2 because the mass didn't change in the system or the amount of moles didn't change. So if we're interested in finding the final pressure P2, it's initial pressure P1 times, if there was a volume change, this problem, it's a rigid tank, that ratio is just 1, the volume didn't change, and then you have T2 uh, two over T1. So you, you calculate that the pressure, final pressure, is 6 bar. Work. So we really didn't need anything to answer part A from this chapter. It's just making sure you don't forget about ideal gases, true, and how to make simple calculations. If you go to uh, apply the first law, it's an energy balance for the process. You'll have, and I'm going to skip changes in kinetic potential energy. It's just changes in internal energy. So you'll have the mass times U2 minus U1 is equal to Q coming in minus work going out. How much heat was transferred in? Nothing. And so what we have is we have the work out is equal to the mass of the system U1 minus U2 where the mass of the system times C sub V T1 minus T2. So we have to calculate the mass of the system. Go back, the mass of the system is equal to P1, V1, molar mass of air divided by R bar T1. That makes sense to calculate the mass of the system. So the mass of the system, 1.42224 kilograms. Substitute that there, the specific heat constant volume there, the two temperatures there. We calculate the work, 1 to 2, is negative 150 kilojoules. What does the negative indicate? It's not out of the system. The paddle wheel is putting energy into the system. True? I should have been clear that's our system right there. The air is our system. The shaft of the paddle wheel cuts across the boundary and brings in work into the system. Now we apply the second law. So we have the mass of the system, final entropy minus initial entropy, equal to the heat transfer coming in across the boundary temperature. Now because if there would have been some heat transfer, I would have maybe wanted to express it like this. The integral del Q over T, because this T is the temperature of my air and it's continually heating up. It's going from 294 up to 441. Often, if the air is change, temperature is changing like that, you have the best way to handle entropy transfer is to make it insulated. See what they did? It's well insulated. So it's not zero because of a, the boundary temperature is changing. That would make it hard. It's just zero because Q is zero. Adiabatic, well insulated. Okay, we finished the second law. We have the entropy generation during the process. The book probably doesn't put one to two on the subscript. I like to maybe put a subscript to be clear. It's the entropy generation during the process from initial state one to final state two. 
And so we have sigma 1 to 2 is equal to the mass. What is the change in entropy? I go back to the property. Entropy is a property. I think about how do I calculate it? It's C sub P, natural log T2 or T1, minus R bar over the molar mass of air, natural log P2 over P1. Does that make sense? So I calculate delta S by a change of that entropy property. Okay, I calculate this to be 0 0.414 kilojoules per Kelvin entropy generation. The units on that, does that make sense? Kilojoules per Kelvin? Entropy generation? Make sense? Also, uh, it's positive. Does that make sense? If it's negative, it's either a hypothetical process which couldn't occur in practice in reality, or it's a mistake that you made in your algebra, or the textbook just has a mistake, or the problem giver has a mistake in it. Because it's a negative. That's right. It's a negative work. I'm going to see if this record. Okay, I need to get back to lecturing now. Any other questions? I'm sorry, I clicked away from that slide. Any other questions on this problem? Look good? In the interest of time, uh, I, I'll try to come back and solve more problems. But let's move to a, a new type of system. So here is a system that has four heat transfers and one work transfer as shown. So here is a heat transfer right here. It's showing it coming in and it's a Q dot. See the dot on top? So that's a power. It's a rate of heat transfer. It's a rate of heat transfer coming in. It's a 1000 kilowatts and it's, it's subscript one and the temperature, the boundary temperature is 800 Kelvin coming in. You have four of those for each one. You have the amount or the rate at which it's transferring in, 250 kilowatts, at a boundary temperature, 900 Kelvin. You have a transfer out of 650 kilowatts at a boundary temperature of 360 Kelvin. And you have a rate of heat transfer out of 250 kilowatts at 300. Why don't they put a negative on some of these outs? Well, it's just like free body diagrams and statics. Pay attention to the direction of the force that you put on there, and that's what you work with. Okay, so once you have an illustration, that overrides the convention, thermodynamic sign convention. What do we have for W dot? It's out, but we have no value given for it. Determine the me mechanical power produced. That's what they want you to find, W dot. So what do you do to find that one? Tell me what you do in principle. Energy balance. Apply the first law of thermodynamics. What law, which, which form of the equation did you want to apply? The rate of change of energy inside my system with respect to time will be the rate at which it's flowing in with heat. If you have multiple ins, sum them up. Minus the rate at which it flows out with heat. Sum them up plus any flow in with work shaft going out, I mean in, minus sum of W dot out, any shaft out. All right, do we have a, is it, which on the left-hand side, why is this term zero? Steady state. Okay, so what you're going to have is you'll have a Q dot in, Q dot one divide, whoops, just Q dot one. Uh, plus q dot 2 minus q dot 3 minus q dot 4 plus no works so we'll just put a zero there minus w dot we're interested in solving for w dot that's the only unknown in this problem and we solve for it and calculate uh, w dot is equal to 6,000, oops, wrong problem. Here, you calculate it. 
350. Is it 350 kilowatts? How many people agree? Good. Now, for part B, the rate of entropy production. So, for the same system, I should have defined our system right there is our system. We have the rate of accumulation of entropy inside the system is equal to if it's coming in across any boundary temperature sum of all the ins, that's the inflow, rate of inflow of entropy minus any Q dot outs divided by their temperature, boundary temperature any work? No, but you could have entropy production. Is that it? Is that our entropy balance equation for a closed system? There's no mass transfer, is there? You agree? Show me a thumbs up. All right, we have a lot of thumbs up and one or two yawns. I saw it. The yawns always catch your attention. <laughs> All right, so that's zero. Go ahead and yawn. Feel free. Um, okay, so what do we have? Sigma dot is equal to, you're going to have, um, let's say, Q dot 3 over TB3 plus Q dot 4 over TB4 minus Q dot 1 over TB1 minus Q dot 2 over TB2. And when you substitute the numbers, the rate of entropy production in this problem is 1.11. What are the units on that? Kilowatts per Kelvin. Okay. So, uh, but I, I moved this one to the other side and switched the signs. A little bit of algebra. <laughs> You like that? The algebra okay? If I came in with a negative Q, uh, sigma dot, I would have a problem. True? The, the ins are 1 and 2. And the outs are 3 and 4. And I wanted to minimize the algebra that I wrote on the sheet of paper. Is it okay? Any comments or questions? Statistical interpretation of entropy. Well, uh, the book has a couple pages and it talks about Boltzmann relation. Here is an equation that's made famous in physics and in uh, statistical thermodynamics. Um, what it says is the entropy, S, per molecule or per entity, is proportional to or equal to K, the Boltzmann constant, and here's the value of the Boltzmann constant, that's 10 to the minus 34 joules per Kelvin, but it's a constant times the natural log of W, which is a thermodynamic probability, some measure of the molecular randomness of the system. So if you have a gas, it's a lot larger. W is larger. If it's a liquid, it's smaller. If it's a... It's a uh, a, a solid, it's even smaller. Now this is based on ideal gas models of gases and so, but this is a very important relation that's out there and it's known as the Boltzmann relation. Who developed it? Ludwig Boltzmann. You can just go Wikipedia and learn about, a lot about the individual. So you see the years that he was born, um, 1844, he died 1906. What happened in 1905? guy named Einstein put out E equals MC squared in a paper in 1905. Okay, that kind of gives you a benchmark. Theory of relativity, 1905. It wasn't probably recognized right away as a great work, but Time Magazine in 1999 said the man of the century of the last 100 years was Einstein because of his work in 1905. All right, anyway, and the advent of all that brought, but especially nuclear power, nuclear weapons. Um, but you can see that he's done a lot in pictures and all that. He's a very uh, successful lecturer and well-received. Here, here's his equation. 
right there. And notice that his tombstone bears the inscription of the entropy formula S equal to K log W. The log stands for the natural log. That's very interesting, isn't it? That you would have an equation that would make it to your tombstone. There's that equation again. And here's his tombstone. But you really can't zoom in on it. So you zoom in by just saying Boltzmann grave. Uh, you get all the Wikipedia, whatever, Google. And you can then look in, zoom in, and see what's over his bust on his tomb, on his grave. That some people even zoomed in. Look at that, S equal to K log of W. That's written right there over top of his bust. And if you ever go there, you can stand here and get your picture taken by your friend and post it to whatever account so the world can see that you actually stood by his flowery grave and uh, was taken by this famous thermodynamic equation and thermodynamic. Uh, let's go back to our Wikipedia page to find out where he's buried. But he's buried somewhere and his grave is uh, at the Vienna... Okay. I guess he has two... He has a second grave? It's like two homes. Why do you need two homes? I don't know. Why do you need two graves? I don't know. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> so let's go back to this. Uh... There's some of his other pictures. He was Austrian physicist, did a lot of work. So now we move to an open system. An open system can have mass transfer across the boundary. And the entropy balance equation for a control volume or for an open system has typically written like this. This term on the left accounts for the accumulation or depletion. Can you store entropy in the system? Yes. And what you store, does it go up or down with time? It, it, are you accumulating it or can you be depleting it? If you're cooling it off, it'll have less entropy. If you freeze something, right, it'll, it'll go down in time. So that term could be positive, negative, or zero. This, what do they represent? These are all the rates of heat transfer coming in. This is the boundary temperature for each of those heat transfers. And so the entropy is coming in with that heat transfer. Now, if you have a heat transfer out, you'll have to have a negative Q dot. You'll have to have a negative Q dot so that it's effectively transferring the entropy out with the heat. And then you have the M dots I and the M dots E. What? Don't I don't know why they didn't split this into ins and outs. They could have. I sometimes do, but they split the mass transfers, the ins and outs. I for ins, E for exits or outs. And so you, every one that's coming in brings something to it. It accumulates. Every one going out, exiting, it's subtracting. It's removing some entropy. And so you put the specific lowercase s times m dot is the rate at which it's being transferred with the mass. And then what about this term? Sigma dot. So it's the rate of entropy generation within the system, within the control volume, the CV. That's it. You just now, now that we have this great equation, we can solve a lot of problems. And uh, second law. So this was our general form of the entropy balance equation for a control volume. Second law of thermodynamics expressed in terms of entropy. When we start thermo 2, we'll have another version of the second law of thermodynamics expressed in terms of exergy. Not energy, not entropy, exergy. It'll be a new property, don't worry. But we, it's, there's different forms of the second law. This is the entropy balance form. Now, what happens if it's steady state? How does it change? Well, that left-hand side is zero at steady state. What happens if you have one Q? It, you just have Q dot in, and you have the boundary temperature. Uh, this is in. Maybe I put minus Q dot out divided by the boundary temperature in, 
out. Maybe I write it like that. And I have plus the sum of the mass flow rates in entropy in minus the sum of the mass flow rates entropy exit exit plus entropy generation. But if it's steady state, if it's steady state, that term is zero. We have a lot of steady state problems. Very, very, did I say very? Very few non-steady state, meaning transient. Then why do they show us the transient equation if you rarely use it? I don't know. Right? We had energy. We had the transient energy equation. At the end of the previous chapter, it was a real challenge to solve some problems. True? You look for a similar problem in chapter 6. You won't find it. Basically, everything in chapter 6 entropy is steady state, which makes life easier. Now, if you had a computer, that's okay. We can solve a lot of transient problems because the computer does the tedious work for us. All right, now we do entropy balance. What happens if I just have one mass in, one mass out? You do the mass balance, and you find m dot in is equal to m dot out. Suspense with the subscripts, it's just m dot. So you can write 0 is equal to q dot in divided by tb in minus q dot out divided by tb out uh, pl uh, plus m dot s coming in, s going out, plus sigma dot. So you just have one mass flow rate. And it multiplies both the entropy in, S1, and entropy out, S2. Look good? The system that had the four heat transfers. Here's the first heat transfer, second, third, fourth. They're all the same Q dots, all the same TBs. That's the previous problem. We also only have one work, one power out. But this time, there are two mass transfers. This is what's new to this problem. We have mass flow rate of 10 kilograms per second coming in at 10 bar, 400 degrees C, and it's, it's steam or water, and then 10 kilograms per second, one bar in saturated vapor, steam. So this is what's new, these mass transfers in and out. So now do the mechanical power produced for this problem. Well, you do the first law, true? So if you do the first law for this problem, you have the in q dot 1 plus the in q dot 2 minus the out q dot 3 minus the out q dot 4. Then I'll have the mass flow rate bringing with it enthalpy 1 minus enthalpy 2 going out. So everything has been positive in minus all the outs except for the out that I'm interested in calculating, which is the power. Mechanical power is an out. So I'll put it on the other side of the equation, and I'll solve for it. Or if you like, put it over here, w dot equal to everything else. See how I wrote the first law? Do you like that? Is it more readable? Hopefully. Well, I don't have a lot of space on my screen to solve this problem, but you substitute numbers, you get 6, 2, 3, 4 kilowatts. You have to go and you have to look up H1, and you also, let me write down H1 for this problem. 3263.9 kilojoules per kilogram and while you're at it in the table you anticipate having to do something with entropy production for part B why not get S1 right away in S1 7.4651 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin you do the same thing for uh, H2 saturated vapor it's H of G 2675.5 kilojoules per kilogram in S2 7.3594 
kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Now for part B, you say, what is the rate of entropy production? Write the second law. So the rate of entropy being produced is like what's coming into the system. It's being produced in the system. Entropy is being produced in the system, okay? So that's an N will equal a sum of all the outs minus the ins. Does that make sense? Does that equation look right? It's like what I did over here is I wrote it like this. An out is equal to sum of the ins minus the sum of the outs. Balance. These are all just balance equations. It's bookkeeping. Put on your accounting hat. You know, pretend you're an accountant, a ledger. You ever talk to an accountant? Well, I don't know why you call that that, but it's income into the bank account, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they have fancy names for these things, okay? And the outgo is a different name for it. I forget what the names are. But you talk to an accountant. It'll be an enjoyable experience. But now you're just an accountant for a while. That's all you're doing, keeping track, balancing. So N is equal to out minus all the other ends. The N of interest is sigma dot. That's a generation within the control volume. And then we have an out. We have a Q dot 1 divided by TB1. Maybe I should leave that black color. Let me rewrite it in black. Q dot, I'm sorry, 3 is an out divided by TB3 plus Q dot 4 divided by TB4. So those are two heat transfers in, I mean out. <laughs> Q dot 1 divided by TB1 minus Q dot 2 divided by TB2. Are there any other entropies in or out? Yes, we have it with the mass. We have an out, S2, S1. True? All right, when you solve this one, Substitute those numbers. That's the answer we get for the entropy production. Uh, this was steam. This was steam, water, H2O. Any other comments, questions? Liquid water is mixed with superheated vapor in a desuperheater. Okay, this is a device. It's a desuperheater. All right. I don't know. A couple semesters ago, I gave an exam question, first exam in Thermo 2, and I had, I think, the illustration I took out of the textbook out of chapter 6 and it described these superheaters right and the student really complained these superheater you never covered these superheaters it's like oh give me a break you know it's 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 a name for something and you can understand the thing now at the time I had this great teaching assistant she was a uh, 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 undergrad student who took no crap she just didn't know crap from anybody. You start whining, she shuts you right up. She's like, don't whine. She'd been, she'd already had mothers, she had another child, she had two children, she was young, she's been at A&M, she's been at Arlington, she's now here getting her degree successfully in mechanical engineering. It's like, don't give me no, go whine somewhere else. I don't have time for whining. And I was so appreciative of her. <laughs> you know. Some big old guy, oh, I never heard of these superheaters. Dry up. <laughs> it, it, the name threw them off. Look, it, it's a device that has some mass flow in, some mass flow in, some mass flow out. It's adiabatic, and there's no shaft power in or out. That's it. Call it what you want. Call it a D, what's the opposite of super? Uh, D subheater. All right, or the, or the worthless heater. This the name I think threw them off. I, I don't understand what a D superheater is. It's just a name. All right, it uh, takes 
uh, generate saturated vapor. So what comes out is saturated vapor. It operates steady state. There's no heat transfer. There's negligible changes in kinetic potential energy. It's really easy to analyze, actually. And what you have is you have some fluid coming in. It's all water and water coming in here. But if you take a look at it, this is superheated. Okay, this comes out saturated vapor. It was de-superheated by adding, guess what this is, 2 bar, 20 degrees C. Can you tell me what state water is at? 2 bar, 20 degrees C. So cool liquid. So you're basically de-superheating it. Does that make sense now? You're just you're spraying in just enough subcooled liquid water to take that superheated steam and turn saturated vapor. All right. What is the mass flow rate uh, of the superheated vapor coming in? What's m.2? They tell me m.1. It's 0.2 kilograms per second. They don't tell me m.3. But they want me to be able to determine from this information what is m.2. It's steady state. So I'm going to have, yeah, I'm going to have three balance statements. One is mass, one is energy, one is entropy. One is mass, one is energy, we call it the first law. One is entropy, we call it the second law. That's it. So what does the mass balance look like? m.1 plus m.2 is equal to m.3. And yes, we need that. We'll need it. Because when you write the energy balance, what does it look like? We come in with enthalpy 1, m.1. Come in with enthalpy 2, m.2. And we go out with enthalpy 3, n, n, uh, m.3. Does that look right for an entropy balance? Not an entropy balance. Energy balance. There was no kinetic and potential energy changes. And there's no heat or work transfer, right? It's for an open system. This control volume called around the D superheater, right? All right, so you basically say, uh, I like to put little check marks. Can I get H1? Sure, I can get H1. When I go get H1, it's 83.96 kilojoules per kilogram. I can right away get S1 because I look at part B, I need entropy. 0 0.2966 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Can I get the properties at state 2? How about uh, H2? H2 is 3278.2 kilojoules per kilogram. How about S2? S2 is 8.5435 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And then I come over here and I get H3 is 2675.5 kilojoules per kilogram. And S3 is equal to 7.3594 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Okay? So I get H1. H2 and H3. And m.1 is given. But by this equation by itself, I still have two unknowns. But I have this equation. You do it algebraically, but probably by just getting rid of m.3. Substitute here for m.3. Now I have one equation, one unknown. The well, only unknown is m.2. I don't want to slug through the algebra. I think you can do the algebra. And, but I showed you how it's done. And so the mass flow rate of 2 calculates to be 0 0.860 kilograms per second. So that's m.2. Combination of the mass balance with the energy balance. Now we go, what is the rate of entropy production in the D superheater? I want to find sigma dot in that control volume. So we go to the entropy balance, okay, the second law, all right, for that system. Well, I'll take uh, S1, M.1, that's entropy coming in with the mass flow rate 1, 
S2M.2, that's coming in, plus sigma dot, that's like an N. All three of those are Ns. And it only goes out S3M.3. There's my entropy balance. Does that one look okay? Can you read the equation? I know sometimes it's good to memorize, but sometimes it's good to just get the equation, be able to write it, and have it. So we look, S's are all known. Mass flow rates, well, okay, I have to do one more step. Once I get M.2, I return and I calculate M.3 knowing M.2, and you just add it, it's 1.06 kilograms per second. So I do have that. Everything's known except for sigma dot. So sigma dot is equal to 0 0.394 kilowatts per Kelvin. Any comments or questions? Seven. Oh, look at that. I botched up this problem. That's Yeah, it's for one bar, isn't it? So, okay, the numbers are off, but the method is there but I was trying to change it because I wanted to not force anybody to interpolate what about the saturated vapor let me look at that did I get that right it's all it's all one bar not even 1.5 it's all one bar but let me look did I get h3 at one bar right yes and that one's right that's right that's right and then let's take a look at 400 degrees C. Uh, yes, 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 and yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Are you the only alert student in here? Yay, come on now. Who else saw that? Nobody? All right, I'm going to go ahead and save this recording now. All right, ready to go again? Let's take a look at this problem. So a heat exchanger is used to condense steam. So you make a sketch of a heat exchanger. You're going to have the hot side of the heat exchanger, the cold side of the heat exchanger. The steam is going to come in state one and go out at state two, and it'll be condensed. And so it comes out at a saturated uh, liquid when the steam comes out. The steam enters the shell side of the heat exchanger, the pressure of uh, 0.3 bar. That really doesn't write well over there, does it? So 0.3 bar. There's no pressure change on either side. Uh, it comes in at a quality X1 of 95%. And at a mass flow rate, uh, M dot of the hot is equal to 2.5 kilograms per second. It leaves a saturated liquid at same pressure, 0.3 bar. Lake water coming in this way, so it comes in at state 3, goes out at state 4, lake water. Uh, it comes in at 21 degrees C and leaves at 31 degrees C. So there's a 10 degree increase in the temperature of the lake water. Determine the flow rate of the cooling water. So what is the mass flow rate of the cooling water that's going through from 3 to 4, the cold fluid. And here's the answer, that many kilograms per second. But how did we get the answer to part A? How do you get the answer? Energy balance for a heat exchanger. And so for that heat exchanger, W dot's equal to Q dot's equal to 0, right? And we just have the mass flow rate of the of the steam uh, or the hot fluid. Let me put uh, let me just put this H right there. M dot H times enthalpy one minus enthalpy two. That's what comes out of the hot fluid, and it goes into the cooling water. Uh, we'll put the specific heat and a change in temperature, or you can put uh, H4 minus H3, where this is either H of F at 31 and H of F at 21, 
or you could put C sub P delta T's for that. Both approaches will work pretty good. <coughs> All right. So you can get these H's. You can get these H's. The mass flow rate was given only one unknown. So the mass flow rate of the cooling water is calculated. The mass flow rate of the steam, H1 minus H2, H4 minus H3. Something that we've done already in the previous chapter. There's the answer right there. Now the rate of entropy generation, sigma dot. How do you calculate sigma dot? Second law for the same control volume. And so there's a couple of ways to write the second law. Uh, one way is to say, OK, steady state. I have the mass flow rate of the steam. And it comes in 1, goes out 2. The mass flow rate of the cooling water coming in 3, going out 4 plus sigma dot within this control volume. That's what we want to calculate, sigma dot. So the mass flow rates are known. The entropy 1, well, that's a little bit of work because S1 is equal to S of F plus the quality at 1, S of G minus S of F. Is this equation familiar to you? You know it like the back of your hand? Good. So that's just like the equation for specific volume is a function of quality. Enthalpy or internal energy is a function of quality. You can use the same uh, entropy as a function of X quality right here, X1. All right. And then S2, saturated liquid, that's S of F at 0.3 bar. So those... Those entropies we calculate for the steam. How about for the cooling water? Same thing. This would be S of F at 21 degrees C. This is the S of F at 31 degrees C. And so then we calculate sigma dot 2.334 kilowatts per Kelvin. Any comments or questions about that problem? I know that we did the energy balance in the previous chapter. Now we just add the entropy balance. Entropy balance. All right. Go to another one. Steam at 20 bar, 400 degrees C, and 60 meters per second enters an insulated turbine. So we'll draw the turbine like this. We'll draw it coming in at state 1. We'll list our properties. P1 is 20 bar. We'll uh, put a temperature 1 of 400 degrees C. Velocity 1 of 60 meters per second. It's a well-insulated turbine, so Q dot is equal to 0. It's operating at steady state, and the steam exits at state 2 at a pressure 2 of 2 bar. At a V, I don't know T2, but a V2 of 90 meters per second. Okay, this is W dot out of this turbine. Sometimes I put a T on there, W dot out of the turbine, T. The work developed per kilogram of steam flowing is claimed to be 520 kilojoules per kilogram, or it's claimed to be 610 kilojoules per kilogram. Can either claim be correct? Could they both be correct? Could one be correct and the other has to be incorrect? Or could they both be false that are impossible? So whenever you see a claim, a, a question of a claim like this, it's going to involve the second law of thermodynamics as well as the first. All right. So let's take a look at applying the first law of thermodynamics. And let me pause and let you write the first law of thermodynamics for a steam turbine and see how far you can get. And I want a simple equation in terms of something where I have the units kilojoules per kilogram for the work developed. The work developed per kilogram of steam flowing. So show me that equation.
All right, so I asked uh, everybody to write the first law. You can write the first law in a couple very generic forms, but you need to get to where you have the mechanical power out of the turbine divided by the mass flow rate coming through the turbine. That will have the units of this kilojoules per kilogram. It is the work developed per kilogram of steam flowing. That's equal to, you come in with H1 and kinetic energy 1, and you go out with H2 and kinetic energy 2. How many people got that equation? Right? Okay. Now, uh, at this point, could I get H1 evaluated? You know, can I get H1? But, so it's, it's a function of this T and P. If I look it up, I get 3247.6 kilojoules per kilogram. Also, I get S1, 7.1271 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, right? All right. So it's kind of like I put a little check mark. Okay, how about V1? Sure, that's already given. How about V2? Sure, that's already given. Just got to watch out when I try to combine kilojoules per kilogram with meter squared over second squared. A great unit conversion factor that I need to remember is 1,000 meter squared per second squared is 1 kilojoule per kilogram. Now, how about this H2? Can we stick it in there and then evaluate this claim? No, we have to go to the second law to see if we can get that much power out, right? So if we go to the second law, it'll help us fix what H2 is. Go to the second law, write it for this turbine, just like that. That's our control volume around the turbine. And what's it look like? Steady state? Any Q dot? No. That's good. So that term is zero. We have entropy coming in, going out, and being produced. It's like it's coming in. It's being produced. Okay. How does that help us? Well, let's take a look at this equation. S1 is known, right? So uh, we don't know m dot, but you can maybe conceptually divide over. You got m dot over sigma dot. That's how much entropy is produced per kilogram of steam flowing through. Um, how does that put a restriction on S2? Does the second law put a restriction on S2? Yeah, that's the whole thing. See, the S2 has to be, uh, well, it's equal to S1 plus sigma dot over m dot. It has to be greater than or equal to S1. It cannot ever be less. The clever engineer that builds the best steam turbine will have S2 closer to S1, right? But for this case where it's a well-insulated turbine, right, there's no entropy transfer with the heat transfer, the S2 has to be greater than or equal to S1. So you will get the maximum, look at this, when you look at H2 right here, when to get the maximum out, what do you want H2 to be? Large or small? You want H2 to be the smallest possible to get the maximum power out of the turbine, right? So you think about this. H2 is a function of S2 and P2. Think of H2 as a function of S2 and P2, or P2 and S2. Either one, the order doesn't matter. Okay, And if you just think about it, if S2 starts to creep up because of irreversibilities, H2 will get larger and larger because of irreversibilities as well. Um, let's do this. Let's plot out here on a, a temperature entropy diagram. Put the dome. We have superheated steam way up here. 
let's put a line of constant pressure. The line of constant pressure is my uh, 20 bar. And then let's put a line of constant pressure 2 bar. Like that. All right. So I'm starting here at state 1. Okay. It's the best it can be is straight down at state 2 where S1 and S2 are the same. But let's say that I have some irreversibilities. See what's happening? The, the temperature is going up on the exit. The energy content going out is higher and higher and higher. I got less energy converted into work. That makes sense? So the best that you're going to do is when S1 is equal to, or S2 is equal to S1. So you substitute in here, say that's going to be 7.1271. And then you go take a look. I'll pause right here, and I want you to tell me what is H2 knowing S2 and P2. You have your tables. Go ahead and take a look. All right, so a lot of people were able to find that uh, that this pressure and this entropy make it perfectly saturated vapor at 2 bar. Hence, this is H of G at 2 bar, which was 2706.7 kilojoules per kilogram. Now, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 significant digits. This to match somewhere in the superheated table five significant digits to a s value in the table is very rare it's like the probably the only place ever you know in the table to five significant digits think about that but it saved you interpolation but in the exam interpolation right <laughs> so um, unless there's another sweet spot out there so if I wanted to clean up this diagram, uh, 2 needs to be right there. That's what we call state 2S. It's straight below 1, so we'll move state 1 over a little bit. And when there is an increase in entropy above that S, let's say there was some entropy generation such that S2 came in at, I don't know, 7.2000, right? 7.200 or 7.2200 or something like that. See what we're doing? We're increasing S2 above this lowest value of S2. When that starts to increase, you go up in the superheated region and you'll have a higher H2. H2 will grow up. A, a higher H2 means less power out less power out. Okay, so let's assume that we put H2S right there and we calculate it and we find that W dot divided by M dot 2S or the maximum whatever notation you want is 539 kilojoules per kilogram. That's the max you can get out. So I come over here, 520, what do you think? It's possible, it, with some irreversibilities. 610, impossible, not possible. You're dreaming. It's breaking a law of thermodynamics. What law exactly? Well, the only way to do it would be to get 610 out is to get the S over here. You'll get a lower H2. Okay, well, then I have a negative sigma dot. Hence, I've somehow destroyed entropy. I have entropy destruction. That's impossible. So it would violate the second law of thermodynamics. That's how you evaluate the claim. Make sense? Should I repeat any of that? Is it good? Let's jump to another problem. Yes, sir.
Yeah. Why is it? Because no from the second law, S2 is equal to S1 plus the amount of generation. If it's completely reversible, sigma dot over m dot zero, and that gives us the lowest value of S2. Yeah. I know it's a couple steps in the logic. The first time you expose this logic, it's maybe too many steps. But uh, hopefully that makes sense. Right? Uh, it accounts for the kinetic energy as well. Yeah, that 539. Um, it was 540.9 minus 2.25 for the kinetic energy. This is just a change in H. This is a change in, in the kinetic energy components, which brings it down to 539. No, yeah, roughly. I got 538.6. I round it off to 539. All right. All right. Let's uh, solve another one. Air enters a compressor operating at steady state. And so the air comes in at a pressure of 100 kPa, temperature of 27 degrees C, which is 300 Kelvin and exits so it comes into a compressor and exits state one enter state two exit it exits at uh, a temperature two of 200 degrees c 473 kelvin stray heat transfer and kinetic potential energy effects are negligible so q dot equal to zero uh, changes in kinetic equal to change in potential equal to zero. Assume ideal gas. Air behaves as an ideal gas with this value of C sub P, C sub V, and K. Determine the maximum theoretical pressure at the exit in kilopascal. Well, whenever you see the word deter maximum theoretical pressure, that just cries out second law, second law, second law, second law, right? Second law, okay? Maximum, you're going to get maximum best performance when sigma dots minimized, when there are, it's reversible, when there are no irreversibilities. Okay. Well, uh, we have, I'm going to put the, the W dot on the compressor out in the traditional sign convention, knowing that that's a negative W dot. It's a power consuming, compressors are power consuming, not power producing devices. But I'm going to leave it as a positive out, knowing that it's going to be a negative dot. Okay. Let's do the energy balance, the first law for the compressor. I pause. I want to see if you can do it. Okay. You give me that first law. And once you get the first law cleaned up, give me the second law for the compressor. All right, we're ready to go. So what do, what do we have for the first law? All right. How about the second law? Second law. Yeah, this because we are given constant specific C sub P T1 minus T2. So the C sub P's are given, T's are given, so you know what work is required, regardless of what pressure it comes out at. Now the question is, what's the maximum pressure? So the maximum theoretical pressure comes from the second law. So sigma dot divided by M dot equal to uh, S2 minus S1. Did you finally get to the equation like that? Yes. And then you replace this by C sub P natural log T2 over T1 minus R or R bar R over molar mass natural log of P2 over P1 sigma dot over M dot. 
Now, there's a couple ways of doing this, but basically it's best performance if this is driven to zero. Best performance. The temperatures are fixed. The specific heats are given. The inlet pressure is given. There's only one unknown. Okay? So if you assume that it's isentropic, S, delta S is equal to zero, then you get C sub P, uh, let me draw it like this, zero is equal to C sub P natural log T2 over T1 minus R natural log P2 over P1, and you solve for P2 max, and that comes in at 493 kilopascal. All right. Now, somebody, uh, when they work this equation, you could do this. You could put uh, C sub P natural log T2 over T1 equal to R natural log P2 over P1. That's fine. You could bring this R over here. That's fine. Right? You could then take that, put the C sub P divided by R up on the exponent of T2 over T1. Does that all make sense? Then you could exponentiate that both sides, and you would get T2 over T1 to the power C sub P. But you, you, what is R? R is C sub P minus C sub V. True? Uh, equal to P2 over P1. So this is uh, uh, 1 over 1 minus uh, 1 over K. Uh, K is C sub P over C sub V, or forget it, put it as K over uh, K minus 1 to the T2 over T1, P2 over P1. Is this also one of those equations where it's in the table, it's in your appendix, or, or it's in your equation sheet, but all we did was rederive it. We just rederived it very quickly, okay? I would encourage you to kind of stay in the crude form for at least until you're more familiar with what's going on. Otherwise, people just feel like plug and chug, plug and chug, plug and chug, plug and chug. And then you get a different slightly application, and then it's like slip and fall, slip and fall, slip and fall, instead of plug and chug, right? So anyway, so there is the maximum. Um, if you start to, if you want to play with this a little bit, just bump this up, put 0.01 here. Instead of 0, put 0.01 here. You could rerun this, and you would find P2 would not be as high as 493. Put 0 0.05 there. Put 0 0.1 there. Point, point 0.2, whatever. You just keep increasing. What is this uh, sigma dot divided by m dot? And you'll find that that P2 goes, goes uh, up and up and up. You can also put this on a temperature entropy diagram. It'll go down. You're right. It'll be worse. Put it on a temperature entropy diagram. Start at T1. You know you're going to go to T2 because that's what was told to us. And go ahead and put a line of constant pressure of 100 kilopascal. Then put a line of constant pressure of 200 kilopascal, 300 kilopascal, 400, 500 kilopascal. And then here is where you're at. And here is uh, the one of the line that is 493 kilopascal, or whatever the value that we got for, here it is, 493. There's a line of uh, 493 kilopascal. If entropy increases, en entropy increases, entropy increases, you're going to go along the same temperature, but you're going to be decreasing pressure on the outlet. Decreasing pressure. Compressor is doing just as much work, putting in just as much energy into the air. The air is coming out nice and hot and toasty, but it's not coming out at high pressure. Not as high as it could have been. Okay? Well, thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you next time.